In this video series, we're going to be doing deep dives into specific nodes, or as the case today, deep dives into specific node families, where you have a number of nodes that sort of share common traits and they kind of exist as a group. If you watched our video on slope blur that we made, what I feel like happened ages ago, then this will feel much the same. Today, we're going to be discussing the histogram nodes specifically, but manipulating grayscale levels more generally. Controlling the level and location of different gray values is sort of a core art principle and you'll be doing that you know whether you're doing digital or physical art if you're painting tonal range management is something that's incredibly relevant as is the case in photography it's something that you will do every time you will always have a levels node somewhere in a graph for the most part and likely a smattering of histogram nodes as well we're going to be using this piece as something to just test these out all on this is a cobblestone i made ages ago and i promise there's a number of histogram nodes floating around in here it's actually hard to discuss the histogram nodes without first looking at a histogram itself and how to read one. And just manipul manipulating it with a simple three-point level is also really relevant. We'll need to start with that and maybe even swerve into a curve node to explain the histogram shift, potentially. It's best to think about all the histogram nodes as sort of upgrades or in some cases side grades to the three-point levels and that they allow you to control multiple parameters of a three-point level at the same time. So it's more of a workflow thing than anything, but I would not like to exist in a world where I don't have them. I guess that is to say that in most cases, you could probably get the results of the histogram nodes using just an ordinary three-point level, but it would be a massive headache, and I do not want to live in that world. So today we're focusing on the histogram nodes. And with that out of the way, and long overdue, let's get to the graph. So histograms generally. If you make any node here, any type of noise, any type of shape, I'm just going to make a cloud, any node really. And I go to the 2D view and I can hit this little button that looks like this like descending staircase. And what that does is it'll open up this other window where it shows me the histogram of the image. So it tells you all sorts of useful information here. You can like select a certain range and it tells you like the average. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with it. But what this really does when you're reading it is this is just the X axis here is the val the gray value. So the dark values are over here on the left and the white values, the bright values over here on the right. And the y-axis is just showing you how much of that relevant value exists on the texture. So it makes sense if you look at this cloud, which tends to be fairly bright. If you look at the histogram, it's really you know biased towards that bright side, uh, which tells you that, hey, this is a bright texture. We'll get so good at reading these at some point um, that you'll be able to actually just look at one and have a pretty good idea of what the texture you're looking at is without even seeing it. In fact, maybe we'll do a video of that at some point, or at least somewhere on Patreon, where you like submit to me one of the stock designer images, just its histogram, and I'll try to guess it, because I'm, I'm sure I'll be pretty good at it. I think you guys will be too pretty quick if you just practice this enough. Um, so they all look very different, right? Like, for instance, if we look at something like just a shape, this is going to look really different, because... We actually just have, it's hard to see, but we have two big spikes here. A big bright spike at the top right. In fact, I'll just move a level for a sec. We'll talk about this in a minute, but I'll move them in just so you can see them. But we have a giant spike of white, a giant spike of black or like dark gray and bright gray, and nothing in between, right? So histograms can look really different depending on the image you plug in. If you plug in something like, um, we'll do a gradient is interesting. It's just a big, big old flat bar. This makes sense too, right? Because sure, we have, you know, black through white, really, like every gray value in between, but there's an even amount of each of them, right? There's not one that's more than the other. We have like middle gray is just as much representation than 0.45 and 0.43 and 0.3. Like, they're the same amount of everything, so we just get this bar. But if we were to like slope them with a level, we can slope that into one direction or the other. It's as you're manipulating it. And then you can get a note, and like a white noise is interesting too for kind of a similar reason. It's just <laughs> a big old bar, right? Because it's so random and we it's, you know, per pixel grayscale value that when seen from afar, it really is just like an even amount of each value. Very similar to the gradient. So that's reading the histogram and how they look different in different images. Let's talk about manipulating it. So if you pull out a level node and we look at this, Look at here. I'm actually just going to shrink this window down, not for any reason other than it makes these look more similar. The 
the leveled histogram and the histogram of the actual image we're looking at. So if you're looking at a three point level up here, and this is like I said, the basic way that you're gonna be manipulating these gray values, um, you have these five handles. You have your level outs, low and high, your level ins, low and high, and then a level in mid up here. And so you'll see reading the histogram that we have these this dashed line here, and that's just saying, hey, there's actually no values darker than whatever this line is, 0.2 something, 0.25, probably last 0.23 or something like that. And there's no values above, you know, whatever it is, 0.94, 0.95, I'm not sure. That's You'll see me do this with clouds often. Cloud 2 specifically, I find it's like pretty bright and it tends, like it's, it misses a bunch of black values, misses some whites, and then it slants towards white more than I would like. So you can change these using these handles. So if we take the level in low, or the level out low, and we push it towards the level out high, we're making the image brighter. So the way I think about this is I'm taking the dark values of the image and pushing them towards the bright end, and it results in the image getting brighter. The same thing happens in reverse. So we take the level out high and push it towards the level out low. We push it down lower. And then the level ins, I sort of think about them as like where that value should be remapped to, like where it should begin, which isn't like technically correct, but it's, it helps me think about it in a, in a bit of a simpler way. So you'll see if I want to get, you know, some black values back in this cloud level, I can bring the level in low up to that point where they were blacks were missing. And you can see in the resulting histogram, we now do, we've gotten rid of that dashed line and we do actually have blacks present, like the darkest value we can. And then we have that still that slope up. And we can do the same thing to get that, these dashed lines here back by just moving the level in handle towards black. And we get this nice slope. It does still slant towards the bright values and we could change that by moving this level mid right changing where middle gray goes and now we get this like really even bell curve which is it's pleasing to look at right like this looks nicer to me in a sense just because it's got like a more even tonal range which our eyes just tend to like it's also the case that this is very useful for a lot of things because if you're driving like a tile sampler with some stuff having a bit more of an even distribution of values from something like this can feel better um we can go into that in all sorts of other videos but this is like the long and short of how you're going to be adjusting these things. Um, just moving these different handles around to adjust where the different grayscale values ought to be. So we did the same thing with the gradient here, where it's a big, even distribution. But we can slope these to create these kind of like exponential curves. So we can make the whole thing brighter, which cuts off our brights, bring them back. You do all sorts of fun manipulations with this. It's also the case that if you don't want to use the handles, you can click on your little uh, uh, values icon here in the top right of the levels node. And this allows you to actually type in the value specific. This is the same thing. This is the position of those level in nodes, but you can actually punch them in as a, a position, like a number along the histogram. Um, sometimes it's useful because you need a specific number that you're using later for a pixel processor or a value processor or something. So it's nice to see that you can do those here if you need to. We also have these other two buttons. The one that's probably the most helpful to look at is the auto level. So this little this triangle guy with the two squeezy bars in here, it's just going to snap the level in low and high to their nearest undetected value, right? So if we just press this, we get that full range back in the histogram. An auto level will also do this. Right, does the same thing. These are the same histogram. The reason the auto level is nice is because it knows what's happening downstream from it. So if, for, for example, you had another level before these two, and you make some sort of adjustment here, I don't know what it's going to be, but just something. This level node above where we had hit the auto level is no longer relevant. Like that barred graph has moved, and these have stayed still. But on the auto level, they haven't. They've actually updated to their new locations. Right? So the auto level is like aware of stuff happening behind it and will keep making sure you, you'll see me just dump these like confetti everywhere in my graph, especially if I'm working on height maps, right? Just to make sure that I have full tonal range at all times. Math is just some often easier to do when you have a full tonal range. You'll see me just, I won't even say anything. I'll just dump it in there. The other thing you can do on a level. So I, I occasionally will use the auto level there, although often I will use the node. 
However, the reverse is true when it comes to the invert grayscale. So you also have this invert grayscale here. And what this does is if you watch the positions, or not the position, well, I guess the positions of the level out low and high, they're just going to swap places when I hit invert grayscale. Makes sense, right? We're just taking where the, the, black, the, the black levels are, making them white, taking the white levels, making them black. We invert the image. I, you also have an invert, ugh, you have an invert grayscale node, which does just that. It's the same thing. It just flops the positions of your level out handles. I don't like this. <laughs> I would almost always, like 99% of the time, use the invert grayscale that's on the levels node itself. And the reason for that is just because if I'm in the business here of manipulating grayscale values, I'm just doing a height map or roughness or whatever. It's often the case that if I'm inverting something, like I am here, that I'm immediately following it with the levels. Because I'm, I'm not only do I want to invert it, but I want to push stuff around in some way. And that's almost always the case. So I just think that I almost always need both anyway. So I prefer to just do it on the one level, right? I'll do my invert first and then do whatever manipulation I want to do all the day. I can always flip it back. It's just a preference of the way I do it. If we're going to eventually do that ill-advised substance designer node tier list, I'm sure in parts, where we're ranking the relative quality or usefulness of the other nodes, when we do that eventually for engagement, et cetera, out the, the algorithm we're ranking where stuff goes this guy is just like i don't know like you know we don't talk about him but this guy however stocks up stocks up on the levels so yeah that's basically how you're dealing with the levels and some quick run-throughs of the histograms Okay, so the curve swerve. This is another node you can use to manipulate grayscale value. That I think is really cool and super helpful. And the reason I'm showing you this very quick, and even gets a special gold border, is because one of the histogram nodes we're going to look at, this is the best uh, corollary to it rather than the three-point level. So what the curve does, and I remember, I'm old enough to remember, where we didn't have this in Designer. I remember I was in the, um, the group that, went through and kind of stress test the curve um node when it got added and everyone was like yes yes finally we got to, i forget what i made but a bunch of us made some stuff that they posted on the community site at the time when they dropped it i think it was substance designer six if i had to remember if i had to guess so the way this works is you can this just gives you basically more handles than the remember we had those three handles on the level three point levels this just gives you more so we can do stuff like the best way to think about it to me is that I think about this straight line as like the original placement of the values. And if you double click to create a node, you're creating a handle essentially. And you can see same thing. This is the grayscale value we're discussing. This is the amount of it. So you can actually move them this way too, clicking on these handles next to the, the sliders here or their position, right? So you're changing the position of that handle and the value amount, right? Like the magnitude of it. So you can actually see we're creating this cool stair step here. But you can do really fun stuff with this by adding like additional handles. And you can change what type of handle type you want. You want like Bezier curves or you can change all the tangents. You can flatten them out. But you can actually make these really cool adjustments. I mean, when we didn't have this, oh boy. You're doing some crazy stuff to get this to work. You can see here. I'm making you know, like several big spikes, right? And you can add stuff in between here to curve it. You know, all sorts of fun stuff with the curve that, you know, this would be, you know, impossible to do with a three point level to get this kind of shape. This stuff is really fun for like, if you had a good example of this, I suppose, and we'll move on to the histograms. If you had like, I don't know, a bevel or something like this, so we have like a pyramid here, right? If we're looking at its histogram, it's just kind of this, we'll auto level that too. We can take the curve, we'll plug it into normal for a second and give ourselves a 3D view. And we'll plug it in and we'll turn that normal strength way up. We can take this kind of pyramid shape we have here and stair step it into all these really interesting patterns. This is fun for making like crown molding or you know, kind of a trim sheet or something. 
where you just take this curve and we can create these little like plateaus. Right, so I'm basically imagining like this is exactly like the long end of this shape. And we're just going to remap it to a brand new silhouette. All right, so we'll have it chunk up here. Go flatten out for a second. You can also hold shift to snap these. Pull it perfectly flat. Let like a little billowed out area. Then maybe we'll even scoop low for a sec. You also break the tangents here. So this guy can come in. Flatten that guy out. Or, you do, or, or, or the cool swoop. So you can see you can make these really cool shapes using the curve, which this would just be like completely unable to do, be done rather with a three point level. You can do some really excellent, cool stuff with this. So this would work even like even if you were doing like a a crown molding, like I said, right? You have this neat shape created really quickly. But this is going to be very important when we go to describe the histogram shift. Okay, so histogram is proper, and as is tradition. Ignore the man behind the curtain. I'm just making ourselves a little example here so we can see this being done in the 3D view as we go. A little ramp here for that gradient. Very cool. So let's go through the histograms. And I'm going to start with the one I definitely use the most, I think. And I think if people are honest, it's probably the same for them as well. This is the histogram scan. And what it does is it scans through the histogram. So what's cool about this is we can pick a position here along the input graph, right? So, or the input node rather. So in this case, the gradient. And you have that position control, but you also have this contrast control, which is going to allow you to kind of put a choke on it almost, right? So it allows you to increase the contrast between the whites and blacks here basically narrows that that slider there so you can do really fun things with this right you're going to use this a lot of the time when you're making different masks so if you have something like a cloud and you're just wanting to make like some splatter right this is not very helpful the way it is it's just really noisy and lumpy but if you were to put a histogram scan on this you can make right if we put the position up and we put the contrast like we dime it right we can scan through the image and find those mask patterns we like. We can use it to mask stuff out too. Like if you have a dirt or something, something like this. And as a reminder, we're gonna go through the cobblestone graph from earlier and actually put in some, some real world examples, not these ones. But the way I like to teach this stuff is like show them on their own completely and then show them actually working in a bigger thing. You can do the same thing here, right? We don't really like how blurry and blobby the dirt too is. We can decide, hey, let's crank that contrast up, scan through it, find the shapes we want, pass out the little shapes, and then add a bit of contrast. Don't be so harsh about that contrast threshold. So you're going to use this a lot to change different stuff, right? It's really, really important. You're going to histogram stuff everywhere. Another example could be like if you had a shape, like some sort of cube and you had a curvature on it. Let's just swap this guy out temporarily. And you had, let's make a normal map, take a curvature out of it. If you're laying in some you know, edge wear or whatever. This might not be exactly what you want, right? If I were to like screen this on to our albedo here, so we get that little highlight there. It's a little bright, right? You could do this with levels, or you could take a histogram scan of this because it allows us to control both the position of the level low in or the level out low and high and the choke on the level ins, all on e an easy two sliders. So we can put the position up to find where we want it, and then we can really increase the contrast to make it this like hyper specific very strict about what the value choice here right and we could say i don't want you know add some more we want that to be a broader highlight but choke it more 
or we want, you know, a really thin highlight, but don't have much of a choke on it at all. Like let it really fade out. Right, so you get these really different looks really quickly. And it's really intuitive, right? Because you just, you, I'm a guy who always likes to have two buttons to press instead of three. And I like to have three buttons to press instead of four, right? The less buttons you give me, the better. Right, so you get these very different looks, right? Really, really tight and super, super tight, super narrow, or fairly broad with like a big fall off. Right, these two very different looks, and you can combine them even, right? If you were just screwing around down the line, you know, screen these in, you get the best of both worlds. We do all sorts of fun stuff with this. So histogram scans really, really useful. The way to think about it really, right? Like with all the scans here, or all the histograms rather, I'm going to try to rope it back to a levels node. So pulling up our histogram again, again, just pressing this staircase button here on the 2D view. We can look at the histogram. If you look at the cloud, right? I histogram scan this, right? We have our position and our contrast. We can do this with a levels node, right? If you could, you'd probably pause and think about it for a minute. You'd probably be able to guess. Because what we're going to do, we, we kind of did it a little bit when we were doing the levels and histograms, just reading them. We can bring in, right? If we do this, bringing in our level in low and high, right up next to each other, that is the histogram scan. The, the, the position slider on the histogram scan, you can think about that as where is the position of this group of handles, right? If you put a high position in, like let's put in, you know, point, we'll put in a low position, we'll put in like point two. We would need to move this whole group of handles over to point two or over to point eight because it's, it's inverted here. This is somewhere over here. And the contrast is just us allowing more values to be present. That's the same thing as just spreading apart on the levels, the black and the white node, allowing a larger range. So you can kind of think about the position as the position of the gray handle, the position on the histogram scan. You can think about that as like the position of the, the gray handle, your level in mid. And then the contrast is just expanding the level in low and white, those white and black handles to have either more or less, like be really tight to the gray point position or further apart on either side, expanding the range. So it's the case that, you know, you could give me any kind of histogram scan image, right? Whatever it is. And I can get back to it with a level, right? We would just need to put the gray down to, like, what did we put the position at? 0.29. We'll put it like here and really crunch a low contrast, right? So you can get there, right? I can, I, it's probably the contrast is even higher, right? And you, could, and you could use the math and the sliders to make it like exactly perfect. But the point is you can, anything the histogram scan can do, you can do with the levels. The nice thing about the scan is that you have these two sliders where you don't have to like chase your tail around all the time with the different handles on the level. It allows you to do all those things from just two simple sliders. So this is one I like a lot. Again, I, this, this occurs, you know, X, you know, 12, 24, 30. This happens a lot for every graph I use. Histogram scan is really, really cool. Histogram range. So probably my second most used one, especially again when building height maps, but particularly roughness maps, as we'll get to later when we're looking at the cobblestone. So what this one does is very cool. Just grab a noise, old faithful, love, love this guy. Probably my best friend, this noise in here. Do a, we should do a noise tier list. So the histogram range. This is very cool. So if you don't want it to do anything, <laughs> you put range to full. And this just gives you like verbatim the texture you plug into it. What this is doing is really interesting. You can look at the histogram here as, as we're working, which you should always do that because it just gives you kind of builds up an idea in your head of how they all work. But what happens here is as I lower the range, we're slowly collapsing this onto a single position. 
a single grayscale value. It's basically killing contrast, right? And eventually, once I get this low enough, we have a single number. And that number is the position. So if we move this guy around, right, we can push the texture, the whole texture. I say that it's one value all the way to zero, all the way to one. And the range just expands the contrast on either side of that position, obviously to a limit, right? Once it caps out, it caps out. Can't go any further. This is really useful when making roughness maps because you can generally when you're making a roughness map, as we'll get to, you, you want to make something either I want to make it smoother or I want to make it rougher and I would like there to be more variation in the roughness or less variation. So having a two slider approach to this is really useful. It's also great in height maps if you just find something where, you know, for instance, you find that like the cloud, let's say, is too noisy. You can take the histogram range and kind of tamp down the contrast between each section here, right? So we'll plug this into normal. There you go. Instant terrain. So if you play with the histogram range here, sometimes you want the height map to just be lower, or sometimes you want the height map to just be higher, or you're trying to just take out the peaks and valleys. So we lower the range to give us like a much we're lowering the difference between individual pixel values here, so it's more of the same, more or less, or much higher. This is extremely useful for just controlling different effects of noise. If we had that that mountain, kind of rough mountain cloud here, we want like really high range. We want it to be kind of somewhere in the middle. And if we had a different noise on top of it, we laid like a white noise. And this is supposed to be like, if we're looking at a terrain, this is just the kind of shape of the mountains. And then this white noise is going to be like the, the really fine detail, like the little bits and bobs on it. It's probably the case, even if we add sub this under pretty low intensity, that we just don't like how spiky this gets, right? We've created a forest. Um, and we can't see the mountain through the forest of the trees or something to that effect. We could put a range on this to tamp it down. So we'll take the histogram range and just lower the difference, right? That we don't have a huge jump in difference in this texture between the white parts of the texture and the dark parts of the texture. Right? Instead of it being really contrasty, we're lowering that contrast a ton, kind of blanketing this fuzz all over this whole, this mountainscape here. So height maps, roughness maps, this, the range is extremely useful. It's also useful to me Often, if I'm trying to sneak something in the top of a height map or the bottom of a height map, and I just don't have any black or white left. So a good example would be like if you had something like our mountain was like, for all you Warcraft heads out there, if we were making Thousand Needles, where you have just a bunch of big pillars, so instead of doing a nice Arathi Highlands mountain range, we're doing, oh God, full loser posting here. We're doing thousand needles, big, huge plateaus of things. Trying to add stuff on top of this height map or on the bottom is impossible really, right? Because we have black and white and it's very hard to put details on these, even when it's subtle, right? We can put them on the top. The bottom is a bit of a trickier story. If we add sub it, it's a bit better. But if we had like, I don't know, a moisture noise and we were just going to like, we can add sub it, right? But we get these areas where this is like the quest giver where you're hunting centaur or whatever to get that note that takes talking forever. So in here, right, we're getting these kind of flat areas because it's already black. What you could do is just put a histogram range on this. I do this often when making height maps here, just to push the white and black down a little, right? So we get some gray value back, kind of blanket it fully, including the tops, right? So it can change, it can give you a lot more room, right? The range is all about like expanding or contracting the available grayscale of the input noise. And if you want to relate it to a level, all it's really doing Let's get a range back. All you're really doing is the position 
slider is this time controlling the the average position of the level out low and high so these guys right so a really like if we put a mid position they would just be where they are here and then lowering the contrast slider on the range is just bringing these needles or the handles here i'm still thinking about thousand needles <laughs> I'm scarred from that letter quest, man. You can bring these closer to each other and lower the contrast. That's the same thing that's going on in the histogram range. And the position is really just where these guys are. As we raise the position, it's the same thing. So the position is actually where these level out, level out low and high are on the histogram. And then the range is how close they are to each other. Right, so on a higher range, these will be further apart from each other, as you can see down here. And the and the higher uh, the range, so the higher the range, the further away they'll be. The lower the range, the closer they'll be. The more you're kind of collapsing in on a single value. And that's histogram range. Histogram select, where we select a histogram. So what this one does, we it's pretty obvious to see when you plug in the shape. This one's got a third slider. It's already really cool. So we'll plug this into our kind of preview render here. It's pretty interesting. You're picking a position along the input texture. And then you have a couple different options here. You have the range to just expand a range. So you can think about if you have zero range, or as low as it can go, you're picking a single position along this input texture to, to draw up on. The, the, Range expands the kind of allowable value on either side, but it doesn't pick that value per se, right? In the same way that like a histogram scan, scan does, where it's just scanning through it to find a specific part. We're going to see a gradient on either side, right? This will always be a linear gradient from one point to the other. This is the reverse of that. You're picking, not the reverse, but you're picking a position and you're moving away from it based on this range. So the higher the range is, the further you'll look. And then the contrast is a choke. This, this is similar to the histogram scan. If you pull this in, you're evening it off. So you can use this to make some really interesting shapes. Like this would be potentially an annoying shape to make. You'd want to get a circle, subtract another circle, or like scan a ring, edge detect it, subtract something from the middle. This is nice to have all in one place because you can very easily just go, okay, well, I want it to be, the circle to be smaller dimensionally. But I also want it to be thinner. I want it to have like a steeper attack. I want it to be really smoothed out. So you can do a bunch of fun height map stuff with this. It doesn't come up nearly as much as the other two for me. Um, but if people have kind of fun stuff they do that I'd love to hear about in the comments. The other thing I do use it for kind of frequently is doing something like a cloud. Grabbing a specific part of a range to do something with, right? So this can actually make some cool, I've done some like animated electrical patterns on some of the Unreal materials I've posted before. So if you have like a really low range here, you can make some really interesting like electricity patterns here from the cloud, especially if you like really pump the contrast up. And then you animate this slider and actually like scan through it or better yet animate the disorder on the cloud, right? This is pretty cool. You can make some interesting, they can do kind of interesting caustic effects or, um, um, yeah, like caustics is the thing that comes to mind. It would also be like dancing electricity along something. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with it um, by just animating the disorder on this, on this cloud. It's cool for just isolating certain parts of the noise. Like I would rather use like the high and low pass filters to do kind of like specific high frequency or low frequency masking. But if you're after a certain detail on a texture, you can certainly try to grab it with the histogram select. So there are uses for it. And I do use it like not, you know, probably 10% of the things I make, you know, that I'll post on art station, whatever will, will have stuff like this, but it's not terribly frequent. Um, so it is one of those ones that if people have some really cool way of using it, I'd love to hear more about them in the comments. So I do use it for some things, just not as much. Mostly for doing what I was doing here, stuff with the height map. So if you just have, you can imagine it with like that beveled shape we had earlier. You can make some really interesting, interesting things through it. Yeah, like a pyramid. You can grab cool stuff like this. And you could have a second one where you grab a different position. 
You can even link the positions together if you wanted to, so you can create some kind of cool stair stepping if you add these. But so you can do neat stuff with it. And like to do this with levels would definitely be annoying. Unlike the other ones, it does stuff that the level really can't do for the most part. Like I can't go from here to here with an ordinary levels. You could do it with a curve, right? Like if we grab this, we look at our, that's kind of neat. <laughs> if we expand this out a bit. There won't be a direct in the cobblestone, though we could think of something, I think. So you can make kind of these neat, you know, interesting 3D sculpts with it. And it's just a nice way to work because the alternative to doing it this way. Like I said, three point level doesn't work very well. However, with a curve, you can approximate this. It's just, as I was saying, a bit of a headache, right? It's more of a workflow thing. So we could do this exact same thing. We have to basically make this silhouette with the curve. If you want to look at it, we could look at a cross section of this height map, get an idea of what that curve looks like. But like I said, this is just not a... Right, so this gives you an idea of what the center of this height map looks like. Right, we have these two spikes and these ramps up to it. So we just need to copy that with this curve node to get a similar effect where we just go, oh, I want a peak up here and it'd probably be straight. And I want another peak here and they're separated by that's 0 0.36, 0 0.25. So let's just make this 0.235 as well. So it's a 10 point difference. Pull this down. I would probably want to break the handle on this one. Put that to like over here. You can see that it is achievable through other means, but is it worth the squeeze is the question. And more importantly, just like anything in designer, really, I can get there. There's a lot of different ways of getting there, right? I think that's kind of neat with the double ring, actually. We would only need the one ring if we're trying to do the one to rule them all. If we do the one ring, we have like verbatim what we were doing with the scan or with the uh, the uh, select. This is just more annoying to deal with. Right. If we want to edit this, it's a lot more frustrating, right? Like we have to like bring it over here. If we want to do the equivalent of increasing the contrast, we have to bring these ones in too. And we would want to make sure that they're all like potentially like mathematically identical, right? Because it's just nice on this one to have it all in three sliders. We move the position to scan to a different part of the input texture. We have the range to change how much values we're looking for on either side of that position value. And then the contrast allows us to put a choke on it, right? So don't allow that actual variation in value. Have it be more binary, black or white. Cool stuff to do with it. Like I said, use it about 10-15% of the time, um, but it's not terribly common in my work. Histogram shift. This is another weird one. What this does, it's most obvious to see on a gradient. And this is one that's definitely not achievable with levels. Unless someone knows some wizardry about it that I definitely don't. Uh, or curves for that matter. And what this does is it actually just shifts the entire position of the histogram and has it actually wrap around. So if you see if we put it on a gradient. On zero, we just have our input texture. And the more you move the position, the more you're actually just taking that. Imagine we have our histogram from earlier. It's probably easier to see it on a cloud. We're actually just moving the whole thing around. Right, just looping it back. So I've used this for some stuff. Like, if, like for, for instance, this can be an interesting noise. Like if this were your roughness map. And you have just sort of a standard kind of generic interest to your roughness map here. This can be a bit more, definitely more contrasty, right? Because you have these like completely different little islands here where you've created these two huge big slopes on either side. Because what used to be just the bell curve in the middle, you're moving to kind of like a scooped bell curve. And you get these interesting transitions here. I've done this for like water damage or wear and tear and things like that. So it can create interesting stuff. I find this one to be the most um, limited in use, at least for me. I'm sure there's lots of people that this is like a 
again, the nice thing about design or anything is there's, you know, a lot of really good approaches. Um, usually you just have like fast and slow for every given thing, but people get there in kind of their own interesting ways, which is cool. You always find stuff that, you know, you approach in a way you've never seen before. So the shift is like, for me, limited. It can do really interesting things. A place I have used it before that I think is fun is to do something like if you're working on a wood. So I have like a wood material here. I built like a long time ago. So if you have this, the wood grain here is predicated on uh, a bunch of gradients that make this kind of grainy noise up. You could cycle through the grain to find something you like better using something like the histogram shift here. Because this is already just a whack of different gradients here that make the kind of knotted wood and wood grain, like the grain and knots of this wood material. And sorting through the position can get you to a different part of the grain you might like. This can be a different way of approaching wood grain. You see, the effect is quite interesting. We're able to actually like cycle through this and push the grain in and around. So I've done this before too, and I've actually like, you can actually animate this as well. There's no reason why this has to cap out at one. You could, or you can have a ping pong between zero and one with something like a sine wave. So you can do cool stuff with it. I don't use it nearly as much as a uh, scanner range or even select really, but it, it definitely is possible to do fun stuff with it. And again, uh, uh, people have neat stuff to do that. I'd love to see in the comments because I think this is a very cool node and I'm always on the lookout for interesting opportunities to use it with. So there's a little bonus here. We're just going to go through the non-uniform histogram scan. So this one's interesting too, and I actually do use this one quite a bit. So. The histogram scan, cool. We have these two inputs, position and contrast, like we went over earlier. The non-uniform histogram scan. This is interesting because you have your position and contrast, just like you ordinarily would on the vanilla histogram scan. But in this case, you can also drive those values with textures. So you could just put in flat values. Right, we'll put in... 0.5 into both. Whenever you have input textures like this on a node here, I like to troubleshoot it by just putting in flat, full flat numbers before, and then a gradient. And it helps you have a better kind of intuition of how this works. But you're just setting these values now with this texture. So you can move the position by actually making the position texture brighter. Or move the contrast, right? If you want to increase the choke on it by moving up the brightness. So in effect, these sort of act like these sliders right now. But we can control these with the texture. So for example, if we had a gradient instead of just um, a uniform grayscale value there, we would have a much higher contrast, tighter contrast on the right side where the input image is white because the number will be higher. And we'll have a much lower contrast on the left side where the image is black because we have a lower value that's getting typed into effectively this contrast slider on a normal histogram. If you plug this in, you can do cool stuff like this where you're getting a really different contrast. These sliders you can think of as sort of like multipliers, but the contrast is so much stronger on the other side than it is on the first side. So I've done stuff like this to like rotate shapes. Um, you can do cool like blurs. Uh, in fact, it's almost like a non-uniform blur in a lot of ways, but a histogram scan. So this is one of those things that like comes up as like re in really like bespoke cases where I want like a perfectly non-uniform shape. Like we could do it over here too, right? You could plug this in as your input. You probably want like a low is position, and you can curve this put a level on our, our contrast map to really get a super strong change from the, the high contrast to low contrast. So you definitely can make really fun stuff here. And I use it for stuff occasionally, but again, it's just not as frequent as like the vanilla histogram scan, which is like, again, for that node tier, like absolutely anointed node. You'll use this like all the time. So now that we've looked through the individual histogram nodes and how they work, we're going to open up a more practical examples. So this is the cobbles from the beginning. I've, I've removed the moss. We'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. 
And like I said, it's just uncommon for me to not have histogram scans or selects or ranges. Here we go. We already see a bunch here. And I'm, I'm, what I'm using them for here is to just, I have these pebbles that make up the cobblestone. And here I want to overlay these uh, gradients, for instance, onto them. Right, so these grains have all sorts of different value here, right? These are a bunch of different slopes that will make these all um, tilt in or out. Right, so if I plug in the gradient, the flood filter gradient directly, we get all these different angles on the rocks because they're all getting this random gradient applied to it. I think that looks too uniform. So what I did instead is took a flood filter random grayscale, distanced it, and this histogram scan is getting blended back in so that I can, I can chill it out a little bit. So for instance, if you have this, just building it again from scratch, I can take a histogram scan of this random grayscale to, to basically turn off how strong that gradient is in different areas. So you could do stuff like this to turn gradients off. And it's very easy to come back and just go, okay, well, I want less of them or more of them, whatever it is you want. The way I did it here would be bring down the cobblestones, put on the random angles, and I had it on multiply to get those tilts going. And then this is a mask. I can change how often those slopes happen. Like maybe I think that's too deep. So I can say, you know what? I don't want any of the stones to have slopes, I've decided. So I'll put the position to zero, and now they're all completely flat. Or they can all have slopes if I put it to one. And now they're all sloped, and anywhere in between. Right, so I'm just I'm using it as basically a control for a mask, which is a really common thing to do with the histogram scan. So that's something that you'll use a lot, just like picking different areas of masks or changing the profile of masks. That's a big one. I'm also just using it on stuff like this. We did this in the, um, the crater video where I was shrinking the cracks of stuff, the stylized stone cobbles, where I could, sure, if I wanted to get just the blacks of this crack here, I could level it. But to keep it more adjustable, that histogram scan is a lot easier. It's a lot nicer to control. So I'm happy to use something like that. You'll see they're just, just about everywhere where I'm adjusting a mask. There's a histogram scan involved. I'm sure down in the roughness, um, I was using stuff more like ranges. It is for sure the fact that in the graph in which I added the moss on, we have some good examples in here of the scan and the range at work. So in this one, and I'm just going to make sure my tessellation is on so we can look at the pretty moss. You can look at all the bells that whistles. So we are going to want to adjust that moss. The nice thing here is that, and we'll have a whole video about how you should work in a material layered uh, or layered material workflow, I think. Here's my cobblestone graph. This is just the stones from the previous graph. And here's this thing that generates this, this fun moss shape that we like. Here, I'm actually blending the moss onto the cobblestones. And then I'm texturing the moss in here quickly and blending that moss over top of the original stones over here. So here's the stones. Here's the full moss, and then I'm blending in where the moss is. To control where the moss is, I'm, I'm blending in the stones with the moss over top of it, and I'm using a max blend mode. Right, so if you haven't done it, you could like rewatch our blend uh, video to go through the different blend modes and see how they work. But essentially, light, uh, max or lighten, if you're coming from Photoshop world, is going to only allow the brighter of the two values from between these two types. Textures, excuse me, sort on top, which is why we're getting a ton of moss here in this really dark corner of the stones. Because all the moss here is brighter than the underlying stones, so they come through. So we're looking at this. I can really quickly use a histogram range here for a number of things. I can move the position up, so make the moss just brighter. And when the moss gets brighter, more of it sorts on top of the cobble and we get much more moss. Right, so I have these, I have like what seems like a complicated effect happening here between the moss and the rock. Like how are you doing this interaction, right? It's just one blend node. And then this range can do a ton for me. 
I can also lower the contrast of the moss to make it flatter and have less stones peeking out. Right? I can do this all in one place. Right? I can push the moss, moss down. So the level of the moss is quite low, but it's quite um, bright and dark. I let more value through. Instead of it being just like a gray blah, which again might work if I want it like a certain height, this is going to allow the moss to be more dark or more bright. So I'm going to get these situations where the kind of strands of moss that are brighter here pick up and flow over the stone, and the dark ones will sh slink around them, which wouldn't be the case if I had a low range. And of course, I'm using a histogram scan here, just like we were doing in the cobblegraph, where I'm just trying to tighten a mask, right? This is really loose. And it makes a lot of sense here. I just want that intersection. We talked about this before in our video on extracting height mask. I can just put the contrast to full. Really easy. Could do it with a level. It's nicer to do it with this. Um, it's also the case that a histogram range is really useful if you're trying to dial in the, um, the roughness of a material. So if I have the roughness of our stones right here, and he goes out this way, I've decided for the stone, or for the moss roughness rather, it's just this simple little thing here. So I'm taking a white noise, um, a moisture noise, and blending them together uh, just, just slightly. And then I'm using a histogram range to dial in the, the moss roughness, which is really fun because, like I was saying, normally with roughness, what you're looking at particularly is like, hey, it's generally one of, you're doing a couple different things with roughness maps. We'll have a whole you know, investigation of roughness maps at some point. But essentially, you're either trying to control the frequency of the details, right? So I either want high frequency detail or low frequency detail or make the lows bigger, make the highs smaller, have more of the highs. But when it comes to the values, usually what you're doing is saying, I want the whole roughness map to become smoother or I want the whole roughness map to become uh, rougher. And I want to control the variation in roughness across the same texture. The range is really great for that, right? Because all I need to do, if I feel like the moss is too dry feeling, I just lower the position. And if I feel like the specular hit is too unbroken, we're not getting enough noise in it, I can just increase the range. Or if I want it to be to very less, a lot less noisy in the specular response, I'll just take the range down very, very low. The breakup's incredibly subtle. So this gives you a lot of control when you're kind of finished your material for the most part and you're just look deving it, you're just setting up the the look of the final textures and, ad and addressing all those kind of balance issues that happen at the end of the material. Something like the histogram range is really, really helpful. I can do it with the rock roughness too. So the rock roughness here is actually fairly uninteresting. There's not a lot going on because I did a lot of, um, I wanted a bit of a more simple approach. But if we had a bit of a noisier approach on this, we had like a moisture noise that we blend in a little bit just to give our, cell, our example here a bit more kind of tooth. Same thing if I'm looking at the rock's roughness. Like maybe I think they are too smooth or too rough. And the simplest thing for me to do is just put a histogram range at the end of the roughness. Go here and I can adjust it all in one place. I can make the rock way smoother. I can have less range if I want it to be more of a constant specular response. Like it's very, very smooth. Right, as if they were just wet. If it just rained in here. Or I can make them really, really rough. Right? So allow there to be a higher contrast between um, the, the stones uh, roughness response and the, and the moss. Right? They're really different right now. And the big thing is I can just change that contrast. Right? If I want it to be really, really crunchy, we'll make it a lot more crunchy by increasing the strength of this. Now we have some areas of really high contrast, right? We have some areas of the rock that are really smooth and areas that are really, really rough. And sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't. In which case, if I decide I don't, I can just lower that range. You can see my histogram or my histogram moving down here. And now I don't have as extreme a jump between the smoothest and roughest parts of my roughness map. You can also do things like, at some point, I laid in an ambient occlusion here where I was darkening the moss. Now, I did use an invert grayscale here, which is not typical of me. But if I'm going to use a histogram scan, it makes a lot of sense. Right, so this was just controlling the green variation. 
I can use a scan to increase that. Right, so on a really high value, I'll get all my dark green. On a really low value, I'll get all of my kind of yellowy green. But I can find an area in between here where I'm getting a good fall off between both. And then I can change it, right? If you can really change the contrast. So do I really want to quickly jump from this kind of yellow green to the more blue dark green? Or do I want a smoother transition by lowering the contrast on the scan? So that's basically it, right? These nodes, particularly scan and range, are really useful throughout the process of making the graph. You'll use that a lot. Or you'll use them often at the end when you're just trying to do this kind of interbalance. Um, Trying to make sure you look at these things holistically at the end and do this kind of fine tuning work. These nodes are incredibly helpful. Okay, so I hope that was helpful and that you added at least something small to the toolkit. That's sort of the hope of these videos. Um, if you found something with the select and shift that I'm unaware of or they didn't show off today, drop that in the comments. I'd love to see it because people use things in really interesting ways, like whenever someone will show me something of how they approach a certain problem and I'm just very surprised and I get to add it to my my kind of collection of things I do it's always I'm always on the lookout for it so if you have something interesting please drop it in the comments and while you're down there you can hit a like you move a couple of pixels to the right and hit the subscribe button that's even more helpful and let you know when these videos come out because they will be coming out um, I did drop on the patreon some uh, uh, a sneak peek of a Halloween thing I'm cooking up I think is really cool. I'm very excited about it. I don't think it will be ready for Halloween, unfortunately. Um, but it will be up there eventually. It will also be on YouTube in some form. Um, just more of a quicker kind of breeze through it. But the Patreon will have a more thorough, like complete real-time walkthrough of it. So be on the lookout for that as well. Um, but in the meantime, thanks so much. Again, hope you learned something. Uh, that's always the goal here is for people to just pick up even a small thing. And uh, we will see you guys in the next one.